Good Grief Worldwide proudly present Grief Diaries, hosted by Linda Sheldon Fell and Angie Cartwright. Grief Diaries candidly discusses grief uncensored as we explore our losses, journeys, hearts, and hope for grievers everywhere. To listen to archived episodes, visit www.griefdiaries.com. And now your host, Linda Sheldon Fell and Angie Cartwright. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Grief Diaries, where we sit, talk, and share losses, journeys, hearts, and hope. Good evening, Angie. Good evening, Linda. And how are you tonight? I am looking forward to tonight. I've been looking forward to having Tizzy on our show, and so I'm pretty excited. She's an amazing person, and so I can't wait to get started. So tonight we have a very lovely and very talented <laughs> sing, singer, oh my. model, <laughs> actress, dancer, and author. Her name is Kimberly Hawks, and Angie and I had the pleasure of meeting her in Nashville at the end of August when we were there filming an episode of Grief Diaries. And she's yes, just absolutely beautiful and talented, and it was truly an honor to, to uh, you know, talk with her. And we have her here with us tonight as our guest. Welcome to Grief Diaries, Kimberly. Well, thank you so much. You guys are making me blush all the way here in Nashville. <laughs> wow, well, what an introduction. <laughs> what do you think of that? Thank you. Thank you, darling. <laughs> well, you know, it, it's very deserved as well. You, at such a young, first off, you know, you came from a background of abuse and poverty. And by adulthood, yes. You had two young children, and your weight topped out at 260 pounds. But you used your pain Mm -hmm. and a few blind leaps of faith to fuel your dreams. Mm -hmm. And your resume is quite impressive. It now includes musical theater, MTV, America's Next Top Model, magazine covers, television commercials, talent competitions, and, of course, your beautiful, beautiful voice. And oh, thank you. You know that's impressive. And and you know, what Linda, I'm, I think one of the things too is when we met her in Nashville, just by being in her presence, she really touched our souls in a very. We didn't get a long time with with Gizzy, and there was something there. So when you're around her, if you get a chance to do that, and the people that have been around her. Linda, you talked to me a little bit about that because I didn't get a chance to really be with her, and you did a little bit, Linda. How much uh-huh. she touched your, how much she touched yep. your soul. She did, and you know, yeah. just to clarify for our listeners, her name is Kimberly Hawks, but she also her band name is Kizzy Hawk. And so Angie and I address her as Kizzy or Kimberly. Um, it is one and the same. She's that talented. She needs two names. <laughs> That's exactly right. <laughs> we love so, it. Yeah, and so if you get the chance to ever see Kimberly in concert, please do. Please do. Mm. She did indeed touch our hearts very much so, and so it is an honor to have her here with us tonight. But, you know, Kimberly, you are doing all these wonderful things, And what I love about it is that you are truly an inspirational story. And that's why I wanted to have you as our guest tonight on Grief Diaries. It's because you have a childhood that was filled with pain. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. your father died when you were nine years old. So in addition to poverty, abuse, you knew grief at a very young age. Yes, ma'am. And and so, and now as we are in the holiday season, it is a challenging time. Tell us about your dad. What happened? Well, um, my dad was 34, and um, his birthday was actually Christmas, so this is a very interesting time. It's Christmas Day, and uh, he was a very much sought after only son of his family. And um, I was totally a daddy's girl. He he hosted my brownie girl scouts and took me hunting <laughs> and fishing. And, and I have a lot of good memories. There were a lot of a lot of trials growing up with my father. He was um, an alcoholic and went through, you know, my family went through a lot of things. But we, um, when I was nine years old, um, we 
were going fishing one evening. We loved to go fishing, and I had begged him and begged him to take us fishing. And so we got in the car with my two brothers and my younger sister and our dog, and um, as we were pulling into the campsite, we got broadsided by a Greyhound bus. Mm. And um, it's something still, even to this moment, is something that's hard to deal with, listening to the glass break and and Mm -hmm. seeing everything in slow motion. And really, at at nine years old, um, waking up to the fact that death was real and it being there in your hands and watching your family really just not even know what, you know, how to Mm -hmm. cope with such an instantaneous situation and just having to really grow up. And this was somebody that, you know, of course, not only my father, but somebody that, you know, I loved very dearly. And I harbored a lot of guilt Mm -hmm that situation mm-hmm. you know I felt like it was my fault because I thought I wouldn't have wanted to go fishing but I was so young that I couldn't quite understand you know so this this mm-hmm. jolt into adulthood but at the same time it, it really did start a cycle to, to continue working on 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 my life because probably from the beginning of my childhood my dad would always tell me I was going to be on star search and he 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 loved my singing and he always he was always proud of me. I always wanted to make him proud. So it's just that thing from the other side that just, you know, always, always want to make Daddy proud. And Christmas right. time always just brings it to the forefront, you know. Absolutely. It's something that you had no control over. So Now, um, in, the a- yes. in the accident, I he passed in the accident. Is that correct? Yes. The, um, we were turning into a parking lot. Mm-hmm. And as we were turning across the highway to the left, we were hit... Um, Side swiped by a Greyhound bus and pulled a few football fields, and it broke his neck. And um, mm. he was a rather big man. I had to cut him out of the car, and um, a lot of people, a lot of glass. I, the, the, the bus actually impacted on the rear tire wheel where I was sitting and cut off my seatbelt. I mean, that was the first probably divine miracle in my life was that my family survived that, and he was the only one that was significantly hurt. Um, very Is that right? Something that My just goodness. doesn't go away. Right, right. And you remember the whole incident, or did you lose consciousness? I remember the whole incident, and I remember actually even at that young age being kind of the scene commander, you could quote-unquote. I remember pushing my my brothers and sisters away from the door. I remember watching my father die in my lap. I remember the sounds of the sirens and seeing the kids in the street crying, and it's something that it's... It just hard drives. I call them hard drive moments. Those things that just never go away, and you can feel them. And you mm-hmm. relive that grief. A lot of people think that grief is just something that you kind of go through and then you get over. But that mm-hmm. that post traumatic situation where you actually have to go relive it and get through it over and over and over again, mm-hmm. and um, it's it's a hard thing to deal with. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it, even it, all these it years is. later, I'm 30 years old now. <laughs> right. 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 And and he but he was thirty two. You said he was. Um, I believe he was thirty four. Thirty four. Nope, you okay. are actually you are actually right. He was thirty two. He was thirty two. And I think and it was you know in April. As you approach that age, it that highlights even more emotions in you. You know because you're approaching. Uh, you kind of it, it triggers your own mortality a little bit in that. You know, you think, oh, my gosh, you know, am I going to live beyond the age that he did? And, you know, and you what also, a... I think, start seeing things from his point of view, you know, him being mm-hmm. 32. And even though I was nine when it happened and I didn't have the cognitive awareness of certain things, as I'm getting older and I've had children, I've been through life, now I'm realizing the amount of loss, I guess, maybe this Christmas, mm, right. um, seeing pictures and being able to identify with him as a grown adult, whereas he was my father before. He's also a peer at, at this age in my mind. And so it does trigger some things, like, wow, how much life was lost? How many memories right. were lost? Absolutely. And it's, a, Absolutely. it's hard to deal with sometimes. It is. It right. is. So you said you 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 felt guilty on some level. Why do you think that is? You were nine years old. You know, I think that um, I think that every young person and anybody that experiences some type of loss, there's always this 
nagging thought that us as human beings have some type of control, even though I've learned and that we can talk about that in coping, but that you really don't have control of these situations. But especially as a young child, um, very right. hard to understand what's going on. So you always try to find some blame to make it make sense. And I did harbor a lot of guilt because, as I kind of mentioned, things were not always great at home with my father and there may have been times in my mind where it's just like I wish he wasn't here. Oh and yeah, right, right. Then 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 he was gone and it was because I was asking him, I was begging him that night, please take me fishing. You promised. You always follow through on your promises. You know, I nagged him until we got in the car and then he passed away. And it was something that carried through all through my life with this um heavy guilt that I didn't even realize that that guilt was still even there. It was like, mm-hmm. oh, my God, I killed my father. And it wasn't until probably about two years ago that I really started understanding that that had no weight on me, that I was a child. I had no control of it. But it's something that through my life I kind of cycled through other patterns due to that guilt that was actually just fake. It wasn't real. Mm-hmm. But I was so young that it kind of just put it there. It didn't belong to you, though. What happened two years ago that gave you that aha moment that wasn't you know, I don't that guilt is not mine. What what triggered that? How did you how um, did you finally come to terms that that guilt didn't belong to you? You know, it's it's kind of a another grief story, but I had um gone through marriage, loss, gone through a lot of other other things and I had fallen in love with somebody and um unfortunately I think due to some of that guilt and due to some of the things I was carrying around I lost that relationship. And when Mm -hmm. I lost that relationship, it really kind of put me on my knees, I guess you could say, of saying, well, what is going on? Why can't I function? Like, what is Mm -hmm. in my heart that's weighing me down so much? And so I started writing and journaling and investigating Mm -hmm. and speaking something higher than myself. And as I started writing and just being open to express it and not feeling guilty about my feelings anymore, (laughs) I started finding that there were some common themes. And one of them right. was this guilt thing. And so finally mm-hmm. one night I just had this writing where, and I, I actually have it in some of my blog posts, it was like, wait, I didn't really kill my dad. And that mm-hmm. writing started a, a, a domino effect of being able to start forgiving it. Start Every time I started mm-hmm. feeling guilty, I'd be like, hey, that's guilt. Let's move that over to the side. But it yeah. took me losing something very important for me to finally face the person in the mirror. And that happened about two years ago. That's profound. And first off, thank you for sharing that. Um, One of the reasons I wanted to explore that a little more is because guilt is a very common denominator for grievers for for various Mm -hmm. reasons. And Mm -hmm. when you said that you finally, it took you a very long time, but two years ago you realized you didn't have to have that baggage on your shoulders. It was okay no. to take yeah. it off. And, you know, I, I I agree that, you know, when you're nine years old, uh, you just don't understand how everything works. And by thinking that you caused your dad's death because you begged him to take you fishing, and if you hadn't have, you know, done that, then maybe the greyhound wouldn't have hit you mm-hmm. and this, that, and the other, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it, it, it's so easy to get caught up in that guilt, and so thank you, know, you for it's sharing that. Kind of like a bad that. programming. Yeah, right. It's just you know, like Linda, a bad programming was, in your brain. Yeah, I was. Um, there's a thing that I, I myself, through my experiences, and I call it grief and guilt because, you know, I and I and it wasn't something. I, it's kind of interesting, Kizzy, that you came to that a couple of years ago, and you know, it's through writing and. Really, grief wants to come out. So just in that expression itself, you know, it's mm-hmm. that's it's coming out, and it's the puzzles are getting, the pieces are coming together. But you know, what I had found is that grief, guilt, for me anyway, and I don't know because you can maybe Linda too, is it paints a picture of it doesn't paint a picture of the real story. When you're grieving and your heart is shattered, you know, it tries to attach itself to anything that you can try to bring reason behind why this happened, you know? And, exactly. You know what I mean? And and it is, it is an overbearing and overwhelming, just complete, and I think it's something that grief causes in many people, 
And people say, well, don't feel guilty. Well, I wish if I could do that, I'd push a button and I just wouldn't feel that way. Well, that, right. you know, that just it, it doesn't work that way. So I, I call it grief guilt because it's like, and until I started doing the work and, and journaling, I don't you don't want me to sing, Kizzy. It would be terrible. But um, <laughs> that's a whole other show, people, to have it would be nightmares. But um, anyway, um, nightmares you know, until I was able to really put words to that to say, you know, uh, I started doing the grief work and doing my work, and, and in my journey is to say, you know, what has happened is is that my mind cannot comprehend what my soul and my heart feel, and so I try to make sense of it with the human mind, and it, it just doesn't, so we we grab onto whatever we can, and I have dealt with grief guilt many, many, many times in my life. I would love to say that it just goes away, but what I can say is that the picture will paint itself when I finally tell myself the whole picture. Now, some people can do it musically, like okay. it happens for you, and I don't know. I mean, but that for me, it was it was writing as well, and it was for me to be able to do the work and to see that Angie, let's let's tell the whole story of what really happened when your dad, when your mom overdosed. Let's let's tell the whole story. Let's not just tell the part of the death and the things that you didn't do or couldn't change or couldn't stop. I don't know if that makes any sense. Right, no, right. exactly. It makes sense because when you start writing, you start seeing it unfold, and you, yeah. you put focusing on just that moment, and you see this grander picture. And I, the I think that's picture. really right. something important yeah. to to touch on is that disassociation from what your soul and your heart feels versus mm-hmm. what your humanity feels, and being mm-hmm. able to see that there's a divine purpose in what's going on and to not feel guilty yeah. because you can't just push a button and make it go away. And if somebody told you that you could, they're wrong, and you exactly. don't need to feel guilt even about that. Yeah, don't know? feel guilty because so, you feel guilty. <laughs> that's right. Make it better. Yeah, right? right? It's a never-ending you know. cycle. Exactly. Right. And, you know, I, I want to share that, um, strangely enough, ladies, I never – had the burden of guilt after our daughter's accident. Why that is, right. I don't know. But I didn't yet. Mm-hmm. I want to follow that up with the fact that when I finally started blogging and then you know, participated in an international book, um, I found that very therapeutic for other reasons. Right, right. And, and what's interesting to me about that is that, Angie, you and I are both writers, Mm-hmm. And I, you know, I didn't say when I was a kid I want to become an author, or I want to become a blogger. But when I f- finally put pen to paper, I found it very therapeutic. Now, Kizzy, mm-hmm. you not only write, but you also write music, and mm-hmm. you have found mm-hmm. that very healing in your grief. Mm-hmm. Very much so. And it's yeah. been a torch that I've also picked up as I've moved forward to be able to sit with other people. I didn't think I was a writer either. I mean, I always sang music and I had done a lot of things, but when I got kind of in that place where there was no other way but then to actualize what I was thinking and put it concretely and go back and read it when it was hard, and I started seeing some things and I realized that not only could I heal myself and get through it, I could take those stories and turn them into a song that could touch a lot of other people mm-hmm. so they could express it, if even if they're too shy or they don't have a great voice or but I could I could use music as a way to bring those feelings up and resolve them. And then it kind of moved to where I became in love with writing and strong enough because I had braved it where I could listen to their stories and I could tell it for them to help them mm-hmm. get it out and right. make a you, song for them. And so do you find that you use that writing to begin writing a song? Like do you, as you write, do you find a song forming in your head? That's actually kind of how all my songs form is I have something on my heart. It's bothering me. Mm. I need to get to the bottom of it. And I just write it out until I start feeling just the clarity. Like if you were to strip everything out and get down to the point, what is it? And then I start feeling that music. And how would I use that music to to pull? Because music pulls your heartstrings. And how can I use that music to resolve that into something something that there's peace at the end of it. Right. And through that process, it's like that's where the book and then it coincides. So each song has its all story, but the story is just fleshing it out and then putting it into a package that can give you three minutes and 20 seconds of healing. It's a pretty powerful thing. And it's like yeah. all my talents use. And so, it makes me feel very blessed to be able to do that. But, 
And and you know you you have a quote. You said, "I am so much more than a singer. I am a creator." Mm-hmm. My desire is not just to make a mark on music. My lifelong dream is to share hope and inspiration with the world through my experiences, my joys, my sorrow. My dream is to be a light for people to know that with faith in God, anything is possible. And what you're saying, and I love that quote, by the way. It's so beautiful. (laughs) It's so Mm -hmm. beautiful. But you're saying that, you know, through my music, you you can help heal other people, and that is a very powerful tool, very very powerful gift that you're using it your music for. Yeah, when when did you know? When did you know you you had a voice? <laughs> but, you know when I'm 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 curious because I, I'm like Angie, I can't sing at all. So like you know, did you? <laughs> no, did I you, cause people PTSD were... if I sing. Yeah, it's not good. <laughs> not well, good. you know it's a. Uh... It's funny because um, uh, my mom was actually an opera singer, and that was her really? lifelong dream. And she went through cancer, and she actually had a gastric bypass as well. I'm sure we'll talk about that either now or later. But um, she was basically told that, you know, if you want to have a kid, now's the time, or we're going to have to not take everything out. And mm. so my mom found my dad to specifically make me, and I think there was, um, and she, of course, so she's singing to me in her stomach, and, and I, me and my mom always had this very, very close bond, and I think that there was um, desire to pick up the torch because she had given up her hopes and dreams to make me. Like, it's a very personal kind of wow. feeling. But at the beginning, like, the first memories that I really have, like when you start forming those solid hard drive quote moments of me singing up in the balcony at my house when I was probably maybe five or six, and my grandfather, who I respect so much and love so much, was downstairs, and he said, who's got the radio on upstairs, Kimmy? And I will never forget that moment. Mm -hmm. It was like I had always had a voice. I was always singing something. There was always a song in my head, always a movie just playing. And my first time ever singing in front of a large group was right after my dad was killed. Um, I sang Whitney Houston, I'd Have Nothing, which is the song my parents danced to the night he died. Really? And I sang mm. in front of my entire school audience. And it was just in that moment that I was there, I knew I was doing what I was supposed to be doing. And my mom, you know, she taught me music. I ended up being, you know, in in the choirs and starting different programs. I play all the classical instruments. I compose. Like, music was my everything. And I just wanted to know more and more about it. But from from the moments I can remember, there was not a song in my head. There was always a song in my head. There was not, not a song in my head. Does that make sense? Right. So, well, you know, you, purpose, and so you, right. And so certainly you were born very gifted with a, a beautiful, beautiful voice and many talents not just your voice, but when you lost your father, your voice may have very well been your grief therapy. And and the reason I say that is that when our daughter died, her brother, who Mm -hmm. was two years younger, he was 13, he was a drummer. And for the next few years, all he did was drum. And in hindsight, it was his therapy. So did you find that the you know, your music, even though you'd always been very gifted at it, when you lost your dad, did you find that was a place you could escape to, that you could pretend you were someone else, uh, you know, that it was a place that it, uh, clearly it was healing for you? It was a place uh, that didn't. It was have, a place that didn't hurt anymore, even if it was just right. a song or just a moment. In one of my songs, I I have a little part that says it's just a moment, but whenever I was singing. You know, it was like the pain would go away and I was just expressing or emoting what was in my heart in a beautiful way that people would listen. Because I think with grief and with loss and guilt, people are really just crying out for somebody to listen, even if they don't know it. And music to me was a was a way for me to express what was in my heart and people were touched by it. And seeing people smile through my pain was just something that just made such a mark on me but it was also those few minutes where it didn't hurt anymore. I knew that it had a bigger purpose even when I was younger. Like I just knew and I was at peace for a little bit. And having peace when you hurt so bad is priceless. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, when you lift someone else's heart, 
you help to heal your own. Amen. And and so when you sing and you you bring a smile to their face, that's actually returning to you in the gift of love. Mm-hmm. You know, it it helps to heal heal your own heart. So yeah. How did you end up in Nashville? Oh. Well, that I mean, two years ago we were kind of talking about. <laughs> well, I, I like well, um, I have a long say, story. Yeah. I had I had never been well, there until Angie and I traveled there in August, and I was an abs. I fell in love mm-hmm. with the city. Absolutely fell in love with the city, and so I can mm-hmm. see why you you're there. But how did you get there? How what? How was your path? Did you get discovered? How 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 did you end up mm-hmm. there? Well, um, like everything else in my crazy wild existence, um, about two years ago I went through that. I mean, my my life has truly been a wonderland. Just praise God all over the place. But when I when I had lost in ship, um, and I was kind of coming to a point, you know, where I had gone through this divorce and and I had found my faith and found God and I found and I knew that I was called to do this thing, this the singing singing and I needed these messages I needed it to go out and I um prayed and prayed and the person that I had been with the relationship that I lost he believed in me so much it's amazing how if one person just one person believes in you and and makes you see yourself for as beautiful mm-hmm. as you are even when you don't want to how they spark light and I I got confidence I guess you could say and I was already dealing with these things and I was praying about where I was going to go and what I was going to do, and he had always said, like, Nashville, you need to be on the stage in Nashville. You need to go to Nashville. And it was scary because I didn't want to leave him. I was still hoping that things were going to work out. And one day it was just like, no. And I got rid of everything, everything in my past. My, I gave up at my house. My, mm. I put my stuff in my car. I spent about a few months working on figuring out the lay of the land. I started writing songs and working with other people and networking because I had a pretty big following through the past work that I had done and a lot of people that were just so supportive and helpful. And so um, I had a uh, a fan give me tickets to the CMAs last year and and invited me to come. And I came and I fell in love with the city and I was able to be there and they, they just believed in me. So I went back, I got the last little things that I could fit in my car, and I moved out. I didn't even know where I was going to stay the night I got in Nashville. And since right. then, God has just overwhelmingly blessed me with experience and heartache and trials. Um, mm-hmm. But I'm getting ready to cut my first album, and I've been blessed <laughs> to work with some of the best people in the world. And I've, I've found a home here and a place where music is all around me. And people in this this place and all over the world are hungry for a good message. So I, I would say God brought me here on purpose, and I knew it. <laughs> so I just buckled Be- my seatbelt. <laughs> beautiful. Beautiful. So what's mm. the name of your album? It's um, called Uncaged. Wow. And it's about being uncaged and being free. And I'd like to say that everybody tries to figure out what kind of sound I have. Am I pop? Am I country? Am I rock? <laughs> And I say I'm a truth artist. I, it's the message before the music. I sing what I feel, and when right. the album's done, my story will be done, and you you mm-hmm. can you, you can watch the whole thing, and you can go on this ride with me, and maybe right. you might find something that inspires you to go on your own ride, take your own leap. Right. 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 I've never been let down. <laughs> so, but it was it, scary. Up, yeah, it is scary. It is scary. But congratulations. When when do you expect yeah. it to come out? We're hoping everything's locked up by January, and I just um, got some great music will be on the radio. I'll actually be cutting a Christmas song tomorrow. I'm doing a little holy night uh, oh, for, for radio beautiful. tomorrow, one of my favorite songs. It's the best time of the year, too, Christmas, Daddy's birthday, and I also get the chance to sing some some songs that give glory to God that has just pulled me through all this. And so That's right. And so January, we're hoping for the full release, and... I've got a great band, and I've just got so many great people that have just put their arms around me and wiped my tears for a year. (laughs) So I'm really excited for 2015. You know that's just beautiful. That's just beautiful. And and I what I love about it is that you know again, even though we are in a really sensitive time of year for grievers, and you are a griever. 
you have been your whole life, most you know, pretty much. I mean, e- e- even before your father passed, you said he was an alcoholic. That is a form of grief. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It is. And yeah. you well, know, and your family go through those things, and th- that's it's right. Hard. Mm-hmm. It's very, very hard. And grief comes in many forms. And have an alcoholism addiction. All those kinds of things in a family uh, is a is one form of grief, and you know you've had all that grief, yet here you are, just on the the brink of you, your sunrise is just coming straight up out of the sky <laughs> and going to shine brilliantly bright, and it will be a true honor to for Auntie and I to just sit and watch that bright sun of yours. <laughs> It will. Shine down it will. Well, my, ho- my hope is, is you know, a lot of people go into the music industry and things like that for their own, their own gain and their own celebrityism and things like that. But for me, my book and my album and everything has been a very personal walk. And I say, you know, I can accomplish all things through Christ. And I went through a lot of things. And I hope that maybe somebody who is also going through those things can listen to that and see my story and say, well, if she could do it, I could do it. Absolutely. And that, to me, is exactly what I want out of this, not not necessarily the fame or notoriety, although hopefully those things come so I can share it on a much grander scale and give back. That's but right. But mostly just to be a champion for for saying that I won't let anything hold me back. I'm not caged. I was exactly. always made this way, and it hurts, but we're going to get through this. And if I can take your hand and help you up, I know you'll help me up, too. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, so. and truly, truly, Kimberly, by shining your light so brightly, you give hope to those that shared, you know, some of your journey in their own childhood. If they had abuse and poverty and alcoholism and such, and they see you shining your light so brightly, you are giving them the gift of hope. And there is that's priceless. That is absolutely priceless. And it truly takes someone who's been in the trenches, been in the darkness, to shine a light Mm -hmm. that those in the trenches are going to follow because they know that you've been where they are. It's and when you the, the reason why that is so important to us is that when you have people who work to. Uh, you know, offer comfort or wisdom, this, that, or the other, but they've not actually walked the walk, it's, Mm -hmm. uh, you're not sure how much they truly understand. And so Mm -hmm. when you have Mm -hmm. someone who's walked that walk and then can turn around and offer, extend a hand, a helping hand to those behind you, that is a gift because you've Mm -hmm. been where they are. And, so, and a lot of people sit and they ask, well, why did I go through these? And, I, you know, as far as getting through grief and getting through things, and they say, well, why, God? Why did these things happen? And then here I am, you know, 30 years the older going through these things, and I see the ability to use that, that testimony and those stories to help somebody else. I right. realize that there was a bigger purpose, and mm-hmm. even though it still hurts, I'm honored to have gone through it. And I think that that's really what kind of led to the healing of, like, it still might hurt, but I'm honored to be that champion, to be strong enough to get through it so I can help somebody else. And so it doesn't right. hurt the same way anymore. It doesn't hurt the same way like it did. It becomes well, a mission, I guess you could say. Right. It becomes your fuel to help those who are still, who are on the journey behind you. Uh, you know, so so let's talk a little bit. You've, um, gr- as we said, you know, grief comes in many forms, and you've certainly experienced grief a- in a number of ways. At one point, your weight topped 260 pounds. And, yep. you know, now, oh, my gosh, for our listeners that haven't mm-hmm. seen you, go to go to Kimberly's website. It's Kimberly Hawks. Dot com. That's K-I-M-B-E-R-L-Y-H-A-W-K-S dot com. And you're going to see the most stunning, beautiful, talented, lovely lady ever. And so it's hard to picture you at 260 pounds. What happened? Did you just take all that grief and bottle it inside you? You know, I do. I do think that there's a lot of 
a lot of that. I think that a lot of um, grief and anger and years of that it slowly but surely just deteriorates into this slow motion avalanche into not, you start manifesting what you feel inside and you right. start eating to cope and you start not having the energy. And like you said, you can't just turn it off. It's not like depression and grief and you can just turn it off. And before you know it, you're taking in more calories than you're burning. You know, mm-hmm. you have your children and, and they're taking all your focus. You're not in touch with who you are anymore. And before you know it, you wake up one day and you're this prisoner in this body and, and you're like, well, who is this? And you didn't even understand how you got there, but it was something deep inside of you, and you you start realizing, like, wow, I'm I'm really reflecting physically, too, and feeling the physical outcome of being so caged. Mm-hmm. Right. And um, I, I did. I, I topped 260 pounds. I had my kids. I was in a marriage that, you know, I was too young to get into, too immature, um, I think, dealing with a lot of those bad memories and nightmares, um, just a lot of things where I wasn't taking care of myself and there's some genetic predisposition to certain things in my, that run in my family. And before I knew it, it was not the woman that, it, it was. Just, it was just wasn't me, it was foreign. It was like looking in the mirror and seeing something completely not how I felt. And well, so I needed to get to the bottom of it. <laughs> you know? we're, we're, I'm an investigator. <laughs> <laughs> and were you were you overweight as a child? Um, actually, no. I was um, I was pretty thin growing all all the way up. But um, after my father was killed, my mother remarried, and my stepfather was a very abusive man, and mm-hmm. um, very much did not like women. And I started maturing at a very young age and all those people don't like to talk about those things women it's hard as we start growing into our bodies and stuff and he was very very demeaning about it so I actually had some eating disorder issues I stayed real thin until like my senior year in high school I started putting on a lot of weight like once I got away from all the trauma I started coping with food and then I joined the military and I got back down down to the weight I should have been um pretty close at any rate and then I found myself in yet another situation where food became the coping mechanism and I had gotten out of the military and dealing with all the, the stress of things that I dealt with in that situation. And two kids later, 260 pounds. Right. right. And not well, not happy at all. Well, and when you weigh that, you know, I I do want to explore that for a few minutes. And it's close to my heart because I too was like you and it it truly affects all of you and people see you differently when you weigh when you are considered clinically obese people look at you as if you are invisible or you don't exist because they think well if you don't care about yourself why should I care about you and it that is even more demeaning and there's grief that goes along with that. And so even there though we is, might be and using I think, Yeah, even though we might be using food to cope with the different griefs, we then add more grief by being that you know, that, that higher that higher weight. And and it happened to me too where I woke up one day thinking, How did I get here? Who is this? Mm-hmm. Yeah. This isn't I don't feel this way on the outside, yet clearly the scale tells me otherwise. And well, and a lot of times, and you just brought up something, and sorry to to jump in, but sometimes oh, no. something that just came to my mind was I think that overeating and being obese, because I, I did a show on MTV called um, I'm Uncomfortable with My New Body, because after I had had surgery and I lost over 160 pounds in less than a year, people treated me completely different, and it was very mm-hmm. hard. And I actually, my marriage came to an end because of such a dramatic change, but What I find or what I'm thinking that's coming to my mind is a lot of people, they overeat in hopes of being invisible because it hurts Mm -hmm. too much to deal with things. And before you know it, you're overweight, but nobody does pay you very much mind. Mm -hmm. Because it's equally hard being on the other side of the fence of being a beautiful person that's getting all this attention, and there's a lot that comes with that too. It's actually, I think, harder to to cope with society when, when you're... So it's nice to just disappear when you're in so much mm-hmm. pain. So I I feel 
I feel a very strong connection with people that are overweight and they want to lose that weight and they can't figure out what's going on, but they really want to be invisible and it's just giving them their voice back so that way they right. can start start letting it come out itself. You know, it's just getting yourself clean, but a lot of people want to hide from it because they're hurting. Right, well Nobody said. likes to hurt. Right, well said. And, 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 you know, for me, food was comfort. Food was a source of comfort. I found comfort in the flavors, the textures, the the, um, the ingredients, all of it. And I've had to find different ways of getting comfort and ways that are healthy. Right. And of course, that's a that's a that's a good thing. Of course, I, but when what bothers me is in our society how we treat food addicts. And I consider myself a food addict. And even though my weight clearly now is quite healthy and I've worked on being physically healthy for a very long time, it's still shocking to me how we treat obese people in our society because it's an addiction. Mm -hmm. And, and again, you know, I'm tying this into grief diaries because it addiction is, you know, there's grief that goes along with that, including food addiction. And, but let's talk for a minute about, so you, had surgery, you shed the weight, you're back down to a, a healthy size, and then suddenly you find yourself magazine covers, commercials, uh, really out there in the spotlight. Was that frightening? It was really frightening because it wasn't something that I necessarily expected. I mean, I was probably six months out of surgery, and I lost uh, probably about 120 pounds in that first six months. And there was a play going on, and I, I wanted to step back into entertainment. I, I I just can't get away from it. It's just something always going on. So they had Anna and the King and I, they had audi- auditions for the King and I. And so I go up to the little community theater, and I audition, and I get the lead role as Anna. And um, there was a photographer in the audience that was just captivated by my performance, and I found that I loved it. Like, I... I it was like where my brain was finally meeting my body yet again. Like I was, ah. I felt right. And so he asked to do a photo shoot with me. And we did a photo shoot and some of those pictures are still up there. And I'm like 23 at the time, 24. And seeing those pictures for the first time being like, wow, that's me. I never thought I was beautiful. Like I never knew even as a young child, I was a beautiful child, but I had so many, you know, self-esteem issues and things. And those pictures ended up getting sent to somebody else through somebody else who wanted to tell that story. And, of course, my gastric bypass surgeon, you know, to go morbidly obese to to being on TV, of course, that's a genius idea, right? So (laughs) it was in a matter of a very, very short period of time that, you know, my light, my charisma, my natural born ability, whatever, people were just like magnets to me. And it was fast and it invaded my life and my privacy and, it was a lot for my ex-husband to handle, but it was also where I knew I needed to be. So there was like this inner turmoil, and it was hard to make friends and um, hard to identify with myself because I had gone, you know, quite a few years struggling with these things, and then all of a sudden go from struggling to cameras in your faces. Not that I didn't enjoy it, but there was still some distance from it, mm-hmm. and it was scary. It was a roller coaster of, of really like, wow. That's me. Right. You know? And, and, and okay. plus the extreme emotions of going from that morbidly obese to being thin, you know, there's a lot of emotional stuff you've got to work through as you shed the physical weight. Yes, and because society can treat you completely differently. And the heavier girls never would have known that I was heavier and they were had jealousy and guilt about the things they were doing. And then the pretty girls were jealous because they thought I was trying to steal their man. I mean, let's just be out there with it. And so I found Mm -hmm. myself in this very lonely spot on a glass box of entertainment. And it was just like, it was hard. It was very hard to deal with. And it's still hard to deal with even today being in that Mm -hmm. glass box of entertainment and people not understanding that I have been on the other side and you can too. So. You know, it's something that you constantly battle with, but I think that the more that you talk about it and that you're open and communicate it and the more hugs you give and smiles you give, the easier it gets, at least for today, and tomorrow we'll conquer that. 
You know, right. that's right. And, and, and you know, the entertainment industry is really an interesting industry. Uh, when you talked about how, you know, when you became thin, people, you know, they thought you were trying to steal their man, this, that, or the other. There's, um, you know, it's an industry that can bring with it some distrust and mm-hmm other, you know, dynamics that that, um, are not thought about. But you, despite all that, you rise above it to shine your light. And that is, you know, that is something that will, like like the, you know, pebble on the pond, that ripple effect, you rising above all of that to shine your light will touch generations permanently. In the history so. of, of the world, <laughs> and that's that's a beautiful, beautiful thing. And you know, not not just the fact that you came from, uh, you know, poverty, abuse, and you know, you've known grief from a very young age, and you've continued to go through trials and tribulations. But that's how we don't learn from the easy stuff. Let's face it. it you know, yeah. if 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 that were so, life wouldn't be hard, right? But we truly right. learn from the hard stuff. That's what molds us and shapes us. And for mm-hmm. those of us that want to help others, we have to walk the journey first so that we know how to help. I mean, you know, you didn't, no one ever says, you know, when you're little, gosh, I want to go through all this dark stuff so I can shine my light brightly. Um, you know, you did know that you had a gift and the gift was your voice. And you knew that you wanted to lift people's hearts with it. But who knew that you would have to go through such darkness to understand the impact that your beautiful mm-hmm. voice would have, you know, on so many. Exactly. And, and that's where trial becomes a beautiful thing. And when you can really just grab on to the fact that trials aren't punishment, they hurt for a minute, the sun's going to come up tomorrow. Right. Um, but when you understand your divine purpose and you hold on to that no matter what, that you actually start seeing that as a beautiful thing. I'm, I've kind of gotten to the point where the harder it gets, the more I smile because I know there's going to be even brighter light at the end of the tunnel. And maybe right. some people would say that's crazy, but it seems to work and in, and it seems to help other people too. So I'm just saying so, science experiment, trial and error, <laughs> you know, there you keep be. going. Yeah, say no more, right? If it's working for you and you're being able to shine your light for other people, enough said. I mean, it's all right there. So so you're writing a book. Are are you talking about your dad's death? Clearly your dad's death, like anyone with a profound mm. loss, it's impacted all parts of your life. Are Is your book uh, an autobiography? Is it? Are you talking about your dad's death in there? My, my book is... Um it's a mixture between autobiography and practical application and a little bit of storytelling or weaving, parabolistic, more applicable to everybody. So there's like a fantasy part of like dreamland, if you could imagine, the dreams mm-hmm. that you have versus what really happened versus this is how you can apply it. And my dad and the book kind of got written through all these journals that just kept on coming and coming. And my dad is is a very predominant feature in the book because he he comes up quite a bit and mostly because I found in losing my father and going through a lot of the other things I really had to hold on to God as my father and understanding that relationship when you have no humanly father to let Mm -hmm. God be your real dad it really it really changes the perspective on things so my dad is there's a lot of stuff in there about my dad and some stuff about my stepfather and the things that I went through and other relationships I went through. And I, I, I wrote it in such a way to leave everybody their personal business. I don't want to call anybody to the mat because we all do bad things to people. Right. We all do good things. So right. I want to keep it private enough, but at the same time share those stories in a way that's applicable because I'm not the only person that has experienced these things, maybe not verbatim, but the emotions and the chain reaction of those emotions are the same. Right. And I want right. it to be told in a way that's interesting and fun to read, too. You know, being able to be a queen in your castle and be uncaged and to inspire so it can touch all ages. Young children can read it all the way up to adults and it can be applicable. And so taking a lot of prayer to get through it and hopefully I'll have it done uh, soon. I can't, I can't <laughs> wait to read it. 
I, I yeah, really look be fun. forward to. Yeah, when when do, I'm scared. Any idea? <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm scared. I'm scared because no, people are going to be like, "Oh my gosh, I got a picture into her brain." I don't know how I'm gonna, you know, because I'm really <laughs> kind of revealing all. But I'm hoping, I'm hoping by this spring because that's kind of the books being written as my. I've been writing really my journals. The, the journals go back all the way to my childhood. So some of the expert excerpts come from journals from when I was in the abusive situations. Really? So the book wow. can't really get done until I finish this step, which is releasing my album. And, I mean, if I'm going to accomplish all things, then everything I hope for and dream for has to come true. So it's kind of a fun way to write, I guess you could say. So it's autobiographical, mm-hmm. but it's almost done. I can feel it's almost done. So I'm hoping by March. March is where I'm feeling like album will come out in January, and March will start a new new book. And right. a chapter of that, those things. Right. And do you think that when do you think your your kids will ever want to read it? I think my kids are going to want to read it as soon as it comes out. <laughs> I think some stuff that you know, and I I really kept that in the back of my mind of of where mommy can be a character more than just mommy even if they don't know it's about me it could be a movie it could be you know, mm-hmm. a Narnia type story in some ways that it can also apply to my children because, you know, my children have a life to walk as well and lots of lessons to learn. And even if my life only affected the development of my children, well, good and faithful servant I've been. So right. I, I hope that they will. And that it gives them something that they can hold on to and be like, this is my mom. Because I don't get right. to spend a lot of time with them right now because I'm in this stage of getting settled in my home in Nashville and Sure, the industry right. is very hard, you know, so right. I don't spend as much time with them now. But they're getting older, and they're going to understand, so Mommy mm-hmm. hands them the book. <laughs> and those great, great. I, I love them. And... Yeah, and that's a beautiful thing. And, and, and you know, I, I, I think of, uh, you know, recently Kim Kardashian doing the photo shoot, and when you bear all, no pun intended, um, you know, you have to consider your children – this is something that they're going to be reading or seeing or hearing. And so how much do you reveal? How much do you share? Exactly. Because clearly you want to touch other lives. And so if you sugarcoat it, your message may not be as powerful as it could be. And that can be really, mm-hmm. really tricky to balance that with knowing that, mm-hmm. you know, your children someday will be reading it. And mm-hmm. you, you know, that's kind of a. Because you're leaving tough... a legacy for them too, right? They're right. going to be like, "Well, your mom is this person, and your mom wrote this book, and they may have read it, and they know so much about your mom." And right. so I want to leave a legacy in my in my writing that's something more more on that spiritual plane of things, something that mm. is appropriate for all ages. Because there's a nine year old little girl going through what I did that needs to be able to digest exactly. the information. So, so by the time I figure I wrote it in a way that by the time they're old enough to have a reading comprehension to get it, it will be appropriate for them. Does that make yeah, sense? Yeah, I was just going to say that. Yep. Makes perfect sense. Yeah. And I think, that, yeah. I think there's a lot of beauty and truth of being raised in an alcoholic home myself, you know, and as, as Linda mentioned with grief being, you know, part of that is that we lose trust and all those kinds of things and, and, and you're changing you know, the cycle in your life for your children as we speak tonight in this moment. And, you mm-hmm. know, we don't want to harm other people, but we also don't want, uh, I want my children, you know, when my book comes out, it's not going to be, the, you know, my, my I don't know, me and Kizzy will have to compare a little notes there because my book's going to be a little edgy myself, but, you know, it's not, hopefully it'll be in good taste, but the thing is, is there's a truth to it, but there's also such mm-hmm. so much sunshine there because we do leave mm-hmm. a legacy. And um, I've been left with, and I'm, it's no disrespect to my mother, but part of the legacy that she left behind, the lessons that I learned were not from necessarily what she did do. It was the legacy of what didn't happen that that launched me into wanting to be able to be different. Not that I don't honor who she is and, you know, her story and her legacy. I love her to death. Mm-hmm. But there's a lot of things that I didn't get in my life um, and stayed sick over um, for quite a year. And then... Um, and in that, it empowered me to want to leave a legacy. But, you know, I don't know about you, Kizzy, and Linda, but, you know, secrets can keep people completely sick. 
and and my children lived some of that stuff and and some of it they didn't live but um I wanted to know I don't want them to find out from somebody else if they're going to find out I want them to know the story true um and and true. put and put in as best taste as possible um, and I'm so looking forward to your book. I will share, 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 share. <laughs> Yours as well. And we can compare some notes. Yeah, yeah. Because, you know, stuff. some of our it's stuff tricky. isn't that easy to talk about. Yeah, some of that stuff is not easy to talk about. But the thing about it is, I think what makes it even worse is when we don't talk about it. Um, taboo things like that keep, for myself, kept me and my family a little more sick then maybe if there would have been a lot more of a, you know, let's talk about it, let's get this elephant out of the room, um, there's no shame in having um, gone through those things. And that's what I've gotten from you. And I see pictures where the sun's hitting you in your eyes. I've seen some of your photos, and I've watched you take some walks and, and, and check your website out, is that, you know, you're a person who's been um, through some pain, but you're embracing light. And I, too, have a father, and his father, you know, God, because I don't even know who my real father is. I have no idea who mm-hmm. he is, and um, and I've had pain in my life in that area. And somebody said, honey, you have a father. You'll always have a father. Yeah. And I remember that defining moment in my life. And, of course, you know, the human to me wants my father. Um, but I do have a father. And um, so I want, because my and children are going to say, whenever you, and, my children are going to say you, so much. We don't know what our kids are going to say when we're gone. I guess right. what I, what I do want to know, want them to know is that that guess what things are going to happen, and this is what mommy did to get through it. You know, that's and right. Passion, you know, well, and it's just like you said, secrets keep you sick. And I'm going to actually uh, merge that with Kizzy's word, cage. Secrets keep you caged, and that's they part do. of why we do. Yeah, that's partly why we do grief diaries because when you yes, keep do. grief secret, it keeps you caged, and when you're able to openly discuss it, then the healing can begin to take place. So ladies, we have 30 minutes left, and I want to dedicate the last 30 minutes to coping with grief through the holidays. You two have a fair bit in common, one of which is, Angie, you never knew your father. Kimberly, you lost your father, someone you loved at age nine. And that left mm-hmm. both of you without that every holiday season. How, Kizzy, I want to start with you. Do you remember, well, clearly you do, but can you describe what those early holiday seasons were like after losing your dad? And how have you learned to cope with them? It's been 21 years since the passing of your father. Am You've, I getting that old? <laughs> well, like yesterday <laughs> sometimes. It, 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 you know, it does. I know, profound, don't laugh. Profound loss will always seem like yesterday, and that's just how it is. But, you know, as you mature, your coping abilities also mature. But looking back, you know, because my loss is different than your loss. And so coping through the holidays Mm -hmm. is going to be different for me than it is going to be um, for someone else. And so having both of you not having a father through the holiday seasons in your childhood, what did you do? Do you remember the early days, um, Kizzy, for you? What did you do those first few? What did your mom do? How did you cope? How do you cope now? I have so many questions I want to ask, <laughs> and it's all just coming jumbled out. And, and Angie, I have the same questions for you. Okay. I, and and at the bottom of the the um, this last half hour, I want to share the ten tips that Angie, okay. you, and I have offered uh, for how okay. grievers can cope through the holidays. But Kizzy, let's start with you. I. The holidays remain difficult, especially given your dad's birthday. And yeah. how do you handle it now? You know, I think um, right right after my father passed, I remember that next Christmas and he wasn't there. And, and Christmas is always a very special holiday for my family. You know, we put up the same ornaments. We mm. we. We strung the lights the same way. Christmas was always huge. He he was a big kid. He liked to one <laughs> one year he saved the hoops from the reindeer from the deer when he went hunting Aww. so he could go 
pretend he was Santa Claus on the roof. Like, he was always just Mr. Grand Memories. <laughs> and those years directly after after he had passed, um, it was hard. We would talk about him. We would put his Christmas things up. Me and my mom, I think, bonded a lot during those years. We would sing all the songs that would remind us of him and cry together. And I was just really blessed to have a mom that could do that with me. And mm-hmm. um, And I would just be strong enough for my brothers and sisters and offer them those same happy memories that my dad couldn't be there to give. And right. I would feel you, connected with him. Are you, you know, the oldest? Like, are you the oldest? I am of the oldest. Your siblings? Okay, okay. Yeah, the oldest so of did four. You, so, did you feel a burden to some degree, or, or the responsibility, maybe a better word, of carrying on the traditions to try to ease the the pain for your younger siblings? I, I did have a lot of that that mm-hmm. burden in my heart, but it wasn't even just a burden. It was. Um, it was also a way for me to connect to him. Like, because people I don't believe are ever really gone. He was there. So it was just like, he mm-hmm. was gone, but he was deployed. Like, military could talk about that. I know he knew he was going to be there. And so it was like, he wanted me to do things to give those kids the memories that I had that he wasn't able to give them because they were a lot younger um, yeah. when he passed. And so through that, like, just lighting a candle, talking about him, sharing stories, putting up his Christmas ornaments, going out and doing crazy holly jolly things um, to give them the memories that he had given me was a, probably maybe even the first start of, you know, being able to pass this this thing on to somebody else. And it started with my family. And it was really hard because my mom, you know, watching my mom cry and mm-hmm. him just not being there, it was so odd. And mm-hmm. it was a reminder. And so even to this day for Christmas, you know, when his birthday comes, I'll pull out. I have a chest of old videos of him, and I only open it once a year. And I allow myself to go back and just spend time with mm. him. Right. And it helps. Not in the minute, because you cry a lot, and it feels like it's not helping, but I feel like I was able to stay connected even after all the years and all the pain mm. and say, look what I did Look what I did this year, Daddy. I'm still doing it. Yeah. Right. So... Yeah, you know, and I think it's important to, to, yeah, to honor that even though it's painful to go there, it's also healing to allow yourself that pain. Well, you're right. Very brave. That's very true uh, to allow yourself to go there, uh, you know, but, but then once you allow yourself to go there and spend some time there, it is healing. It, it is yeah. healing, and I think that that's what's so, so scary for grievers is that they, when they go there, you fight that fear that you're going to always stay there and not be able to get out of it. You know, mm-hmm. that black abyss, when you allow yourself to mm-hmm. go there, you know, there's that fear of, oh, my gosh, this is this is overwhelming. It's crushing. I don't think I can I can, you know, get out of this. And, you know, those are waves of of grief that Angie and I have talked about Mm -hmm. on the show. Mm -hmm. And you just, you kind of ride that way. But, uh, you know, truly by allowing yourself to go there and be there and to spend time there. Well, you're taking away the steam of fear. Right, (laughs) right. If you just go there and get it over with and you're not fighting it the whole time, it can be a beautiful experience rather than Mm -hmm. something that you're constantly trying to push out of your head and, manifesting like we talked about addiction and a lot of people Mm -hmm. they're so running from that moment on their knees of just being there like it's not that scary but it feels like it i mean i'm not faint Mm -hmm. i i still deal with the fear of putting up the christmas tree and somebody just gave me my first christmas tree i'm finally got a house and settling and so i'm gonna spend that time to take out that beautiful yeah i'm gonna go there you know but then i take out the fear from it and it's amazing how So many people bottle things and they don't communicate and they don't talk because they're so afraid, but they're really only making themselves sicker by the fear. So just face it. Just do it. It's going to hurt either which way. But you might find something beautiful at the end of it. So you pull out the chest on Christmas Day or Christmas Eve? Christmas Eve. I pull it out on Christmas Eve right around midnight. And I spend those those late hours, and I turn on all the Christmas movies, and and I pull it out, and I set it out, and something that I do privately, I have the jacket I was wearing the night that he was killed, and I have things mm-hmm. that I saved, and I just allow myself to just be there and 
cry about it and not feel guilty. Right. Right. You, and give you per- make some dip permission. that he really liked and smell his cologne, you know, I, I and just, just go there and be with him. And it's funny because I can feel his arms around me. He's mm-hmm. still there, you know. Mm-hmm. And and I let myself feel proud. And I, I just... I just take it all in, and then I go to bed, and I wake up puffy-eyed in the morning, and I feel <laughs> like, wow, we got through another year, and we're going to kick butt this next year, Dad, you know? And That's right. And maybe it's my dad, and maybe it's my connection to God, but either which way, I'm spending time with somebody who loves me out mm-hmm. of Well, you right. know, so, love, lo- love knows no bounds. There's no end to love. and Never. Never. And so when you go there, and you're spending that time you know, with your dad, that love, you can feel his arms around you with that love because love is an energy that transcends everything. That's a gift from God is love. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that transcends everything. Angie, you never knew your father ever. Mm -hmm. And and you you have shared that you were conceived during one of your mom's alcoholic blackouts. Right. What was, what were the holidays for you Growing, you actually you had different father figures that came in yeah. and out. One, yeah, I, I, and, and the one that I thought originally was my father was was it turned I you know called him the monster because I was very abusive right. to us. So we grew up and I grew up as a little girl, four and five years old, completely. I knew fear. It was my first feeling in my life was fear. It mm-hmm. wasn't love or anything like that. So, um, you know, and and I. You know, I love the grief diaries. That's why we do this show and, and we talk openly and candidly. And I'm I'm one to push the bar not I, not only for myself because you know I've we I just believe that when I can stand in the truest of the truth, um, I'm that's the where I'm the most free. And so I don't remember Christmases and birthdays, things like that. There was no. Uh, we had no traditions or anything. I'm the oldest of seven children, and so, and many have heard my story. You know, my first real memory is of finding my sister deceased, who was like 11 months old. So, I don't remember yeah. traditions or Christmases or things like that. And there wasn't, and I don't remember Christmases and traditions at 10 or 11 and 12. I remember at 12 finding out that she did not know who my father was. I'm not saying I don't remember a Christmas tree one time, but I lived with a lot of trauma. Um, and if mm-hmm. anybody knows about PTSD and growing up like that, you really yes, have yeah. a lot of different spots of what you remember fighting and running and phone calls and police stations and hiding in the back of things. And, and that, that is my story. And so, and then for, after my husband was killed, um, I did what, uh, cause he mentioned is I, I numbed everything out and pushed it away. By then I had three little children and it's by God's grace only that I'm sitting here even on this phone call um, and have the blessing of having them in my life, that what I had to do in healing is to recreate my own um, because I could stay in the thought of I never had it, so I'll never have it, or I could create it. And creation's a beautiful Amen. thing, and a lot of times creation comes from pain. And um, I couldn't get out of the pain for many, many, many years. If you think about um, some of the things I've shared over the radio and that since we've been together, Linda, is that if you don't, if you're never taught coping skills, um, our coping skills I lived with is you don't talk about it, you look the other way, it never happened, um, you know, police were bad, you know, things like that. So my coping skills were running, drinking, using, fighting, all of that. So I had no coping skills. And we had one death after another in our family and suicides on top of each other. And my mom died in 2010 of an overdose. I am the oldest of seven children and felt like it was my, and still do, they they call me the matriarch, which I laugh about now because I'm like, what a matriarch I am. (laughs) But are you serious? I just have to laugh at that. but, But it's the truth, and it's an honor to be called that. And what it is is continuing to live, um, and continuing to try to the best of my ability to create um, life, um, you know. And I have to tell you, uh, Linda knows maybe, I don't know if she remembers, but, you know, when my mom died in 2010, you guys, I canceled Thanksgiving. Now, my family had Thanksgiving, but I canceled it. I My mom had died November the 10th. There was no possible way. And I had to allow myself and honor myself 
and let myself embrace that and be okay with that. I was completely traumatized and was not able to function, and there was nothing wrong with that. And what happened is is that that day passed, um, and I've gone on to to celebrate the holidays. You know, I I can do that. But um, I used to be stuck in what I didn't have, and I think that's a part of the process. Um, And then, Mm -hmm. you know, really I was a kid that fought for her life, and and in 2010, I had to make the decision, Kizzy, I don't know how many times you might have had to decide to do that, but there is a decision there. And it is. There is. I'm, I am going, she got in that car, Linda, and she went to Nashville. And I get emotional about stuff like that. Yeah. Well, you yeah. have to be a that's creator. A, that's, a de- that's a decision to say just because of this circumstance or that circumstance, those do not define what my future needs to be. They are part of every bit, every pain, every secret, every, every, all of it is who I am today. And, you know, it wasn't just the other day I stood, I sat with somebody across the table who was in so much pain and they probably couldn't have come to anybody else. And I knew at that time, and it's happened over and over again, that we are the carriers of those stories for reasons. We think we're going through these things, but they're, they're the messages for others. Right. Because absolutely I needed I needed that person needed me. God believe I believe God put that person in my life to have the experiences that I had because it couldn't have gone to somebody else. And and that has been my list of gratitude. There have been people put in my life that have been Linda's been one. I'll put you I'll put you on blast. Um, <laughs> that have been somebody angels Twitter, that somebody Twitter. I have a family that goes from Boston to Washington to <laughs> Kansas to everywhere. Amen. I'm an orphan and I don't care. You know, I mean, I, I love people who've loved me and been there and allowed me to be a mess. And in that time, what has happened is I've been able to become who I am today, which is the carrier of a lot of tragedy, but also the carrier of a lot of hope, you know, right. and, and, and you so, know, and um, family, family comes yes. in many ways. Family comes in it many sure ways and I forms have more and many forms than I do yeah. biological. Yeah. Just and you know, yeah. just what you said, like with you and, and, and Kimberly, both, you could have stayed yes. in the circumstances. What I did for 10 years. You both, you, right. But you then, made that decision yes. to to make a change. And Kimberly yes. did the same. And that decision not only affected both of you, it affected those around you, and then yes. it affected thousands others that you will never meet. And, and, I know, you, and, I, and, the, not, and the day that I didn't do Thanksgiving, I got, I got to tell you guys this. I don't feel guilty about it. When, why should I don't you? feel I was guilty? I'll tell you why I don't feel guilty about, about it. it. I'll tell you why I don't feel guilty about it. Because I needed to allow my children to know when I'm not here on this earth and something tragic happens in their life, that it's okay not to go with the Joneses. It can kill you. That you have to find your yeah. own unique, you have to find your own unique, you've got to be yourself. And you've got to validate who you are. You don't need to keep up with the Joneses. The mask will kill me. And for 10 years it almost did. I almost tried to take my, I don't know, I think I said three times. You know, I lived, I almost mm-hmm. died several times in my life uh, by my own hand. Mm-hmm. Um, and it almost killed me. And so embracing, like her getting, you know, you talking about opening that chest and saying, here we go, is really honoring. My mother would not have said, Angie, how dare you not do Thanksgiving? <laughs> she probably was sitting beside well, me and hold my hand while I was watching you know another much- movie. <laughs> And how many people feel, and, and this is just something that that I wanted to say when you said that, it just came to my mind, that how many people feel guilt about not feeling guilt whenever you decide, like, this is not yeah. your life, this is mine, you can't walk in my head, I don't want yeah. to celebrate Thanksgiving yeah. this year because this is my personal space and I'm going to take that and own it. And then you mm-hmm. feel guilty about having a happy memory. You feel, and then, so then you have to exactly. work through not exactly. feeling guilty about just loving your life. And during that time, it's so hard because everybody wants to tell you what you should feel and exactly. what you could feel and what you should be doing. And then you start harboring guilt on that. Like you feel bad about having a good well, day. living through honestly, other people. Yes. And, and when you it's live not their through other people, to even be you're in not. It. Right. When I live through other people and I've done it, I could do it tomorrow. 
It's not something that I, I'm just rid of. I'm a human being. But when I live through other people, I really, really, really don't honor who I really am. And I don't honor who, what I've lived. And I don't honor those in heaven. I have to honor Angie because, you know, they love me and they want me around, whether they're in heaven or they're here. And so when I get to love do that. Love others as you love yourself. I am so way more, more. If you give you me a day yourself. to cancel. Yeah, you, if you give me a day to cancel Thanksgiving and you leave me alone, guess what? You're probably going to get more of me that week. But if I have plates, put the mask on and have lived in misery, I'm probably not going to be very well for the next two weeks and maybe even four weeks. So it's easier well, to Well, then when you fall apart, people are release. wondering why you fell apart. And they're like, well, what's yes. wrong with you? And it's like, well, because I didn't honor myself when I needed to. If you just get out exactly. of my brain space. Amen. <laughs> I'm, right, I'm adopting you. I'm adopting Kizzy. I just want to tell you all that online. <laughs> Live recorded. She's adopted. You, Me and Linda. Linda should be adopt. I'm adopting her from Nashville. I think we should adopt her. And she you know, wait until her. you ladies come back out. <laughs> oh yeah, I can't. I think we can't wait either. Yeah, I know. You, Angie, you you officially declared you were adopting Kizzy on August 30th, National Grief Awareness Day this last year. When we were in Nashville, now you're now you're just making it. Uh, you know, proclaiming it, 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 I don't know if she knew it, it though, but I but I did. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we've she got ten minutes. Up. I don't. I really don't need her answer. <laughs> I, <laughs> I've been stand you. up. <laughs> Oh, I love so you guys meaty. too. You're my sisters. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That's it. That's absolutely. It. Family That's family comes in many forms. So ladies, we have yes, ten minutes do. left and we have ten okay. minutes ten tips that we want to leave our listeners with. And I'm going to go ahead and just go right through them. If you, both of either of you or both of you have something to add, I'm going to pause after each one and feel free to jump in there. Okay. Okay. And if you disagree, that's perfectly okay. I, I, everyone, I, you know, because what works for one may not work for another. And because this is something we're leaving our listeners with, it's important to feel that you have a voice to say, that didn't work for me, and here's why, and here's what I offer in its place, okay? Does that sound okay. fair? Sounds more fair, darling. All righty. Darling. So, number one. This is a list for grievers. This is tips. And as we know, grief is as unique to each of us as our own fingerprint. So Mm -hmm. not all of these are going to work. I'm going to offer them. We've published these uh, for the past two holiday seasons. If you have something to add, just jump in there. So the first one is try to maintain your usual holiday customs. But That completely contradicts what Angie was just talking about. And that's okay. That's perfectly okay. And I want to talk about that here in a second. But what I found brought comfort was to maintain the usual holiday custom. And why that was important for me is because when you are in profound loss, profound grief, you've lost all sense of normalcy. And Mm -hmm. I found it comforting to rely upon memory of what was once normal. And what it did for me, that familiar sense of that familiar routine offered me a sense of reassurance that not everything in my life had changed. And Mm -hmm. staying true to what was once familiar Mm -hmm. helped me stay grounded through the holiday hustle. Because Mm -hmm. as we all know, the holiday hustle and bustle is chaotic, overwhelming, and grief is chaotic and overwhelming. Mm -hmm. And so by staying the course, for me in particular, it helped me to stay grounded to by hanging on to what I knew was once normal for me. Does that Mm -hmm. make sense? Sure. And so rather than trying rather than trying to change your holiday custom when you're in profound grief, it's not a good time to try to change anything. So I found it comforting to to held true to what I always knew was normal. But Angie, like you said, you didn't celebrate Thanksgiving, and it's important to honor that. And uh, you know, have you ever heard of John Edward? I wrote. I, oh I yeah, read, I love him. <laughs> right, I read one of his books years Amazing. back. And when he lost his mother, he's an author, TV mm-hmm. host. Uh, it does all kinds of things. When he lost his mother, he did not celebrate Christmas for seven years. Mm-hmm. And what is important about that is that you honor what is true for yourself. And so if you do exactly. not know what's true for yourself, then 
I would encourage you to consider just maintaining what you've always done because it's just mm-hmm. less less change for you. But mm-hmm. if you find that you want to cancel the holidays altogether, you don't need anyone's permission. No. No. You don't need anyone's no. permission. And I I think that's an important thing, like honoring the holiday traditions. It depends. Like you said, grief is individual to everyone. And if it's too overwhelming, to not let it become so overwhelming that you recede into depression and right. block yourself right. out from other people. So sometimes you just have to take that time to decide if you're going to push through it for the sake of it's pushing right for through you. it or if it's too much. Mm-hmm. But at right. some point, if it's not right this year for your Christmas, then you have to do some other things, make make sure. yourself safe. But try try to set yourself a goal to to get back to where you can have those mm-hmm. conditions and add on them. Create the existence that you want around you. But exactly. don't feel bad if it's just too much this year. But I'd be able to stop and identify for a minute, well, why is it too much this year? Right. And if that's the case, try to get back on the horse later. But don't right. don't just get off. And the next year, right. in the memory next year, I was celebrating Thanksgiving. So, right. you know, and it was and like I have mm-hmm. children and I started celebrating Thanksgiving. And I, you know, so after the first year, I didn't do that. You but just needed that year, one year to yeah, say. Yeah, and the second year it was like, you know what, seen. I've got children and I'm going right. to celebrate Thanksgiving. Mm-hmm. That was right. a switch. Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah. ladies, we've, we've got five minutes, so I'm going to run through these fairly quickly. Number two, okay. give give yourself lots of breathing room and avoid packing the schedule too full because grieving is emotionally exhausting most days anyway, and you must allow for plenty of rest to minimize raw nerves. And this is never more important than it is during the holiday flurry of shopping, school performances, parties, all mm. of that. So give yourself lots Amen. of breathing room and avoid packing the schedule too full. Number three, cut yourself some slack and buy store-bought. Grieving is naturally distracting, which invites opportunities for kitchen disasters, which in turn mm-hmm. can cause your coping skills to quickly <laughs> evaporate. So I love if your family, Yeah, if your family expects your legendary dinner rolls, Cheat elsewhere on the menu, such as purchasing gourmet mashed potatoes and gravy from the deli. Because what happens when you're distracted from grief exactly. is that you yeah. could you can forget to set the timer and suddenly that mm. your you know, your family treasured heirloom recipe dinner rolls <laughs> is suddenly black and you're fighting a fire and you know, that kind of thing. So, um you know, because grief is naturally distracting it does invite well, opportunities for kitchen disasters. And so cut yourself some slack and buy, you know, buy some store bought where you can. Okay. And also well, and first, ask for help. Ask for ask, help. Uh, I'll just add on that. Great. Ask for help. That's, if you're grieving mm-hmm. and you're going through something, don't have too much pride to say, I need some help. We're going to pull mm-hmm. this off. Help Absolutely. me. And That's somebody a great one. Up. So don't be too ashamed to ask for help. Great mm-hmm. one. Great one. Number four, treat yourself to lots of TLC. Tenderly soothing sensitive parts of your body is an attentive way to honor your emotional pain during exhausting times. And my favorite, favorite way (laughs) is to wear an especially luxurious soft pair of socks. But if you don't like socks, put extra whipped cream on your mocha. If you don't like mocha, indulge in a bar of aromatherapy soap from the dollar store to use in your bath or shower. And while these Mm -hmm. these gestures do nothing to erase erase the emotional heartache, they do offer your physical body a reminder that not all pleasure Mm -hmm. is lost. And that's that's important. Number five, take time to create peaceful surroundings. Turn off your computer, light a fragrant candle, grab a soft blanket, and my favorite... Plan to watch one favorite movie or show every evening. I love the mm-hmm. holiday shows. They take you out of your pain. Priceless. Yep. Number six, <laughs> give yourself permission to feel some joy. If you find that you're suddenly humming to the holiday music in the elevator, don't stop. Feeling joy during the grieving process does not invalidate Amen. our loved one's memory and it can help to balance out the sadness. So if mm-hmm. you find yourself singing to Santa's coming down the (laughs) the chimney. Don't stop. Allow yourself to do it. Number seven, find a way for you and your family to include your loved one's memory in the festivities. So, and I'm just going to say this from... From my perspective, with Allie, you know, she was 15 when she passed. Suddenly, what did I do with her stocking? Well, she loved cats, and we had two cats, 
and I filled her stocking with kitty toys from the dollar store. Number eight, Aww. do something in the community that lifts your spirits. It's humbling yet gratifying to help others, and it's a good reminder that we aren't alone in our struggles, and that's really, really, that's mm-hmm. imperative. Number nine, if you need to hide from the world during this difficult time, Take comfort knowing that many need to hibernate this time of year and apologize to no one. Number 10, give in to the tears as often as needed. Mm -hmm. There's no shortage of raw emotions over the holidays, and crying is our way of releasing those feelings. And remember that tears are healing no matter what. Ladies, it has been a true honor to have you, Kimberly. Join us tonight as Mm -hmm. Angie and I talk about the holidays. Thank you. And, you know, we will be your first fans and you're yeah. getting your autograph. And we're so proud of you, first off, uh, for, yeah. you know, you came from, a, 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 you know, a really challenging childhood. And now your light shines brightly and it's only going to get brighter. And so if you'd like to contact Kimberly, her website is KimberlyHawks.com. That's K-I-M-B-E-R-L-Y-H-A-W-K-S.com. She's on Facebook, Kimberly M as in Mary Hawks, and on Twitter at Kimberly Hawks. And you can also email her at Kimberly Hawks Music at gmail.com. Kimberly, Merry Christmas to you. And thank, oh, thank you, you for spending your evening with Angie and I here on Grief Diaries. It's truly been an honor. And I'm in awe and inspired by all that you do and all the mm-hmm. lives that you're going to touch from this day forward. And it, it'll be a true treat. To watch you. Well, I'm being truly blessed and loved by you ladies as well. Thank you so much, <laughs> you guys. Just your conversation has helped me more than you know. So oh. just giving and giving, right? Circle of blessing. Right. Merry Christmas to you, my love, and Happy New Year. I look forward to all the great things that 2015 is going to bring you. And to our listeners, thanks for joining us tonight. And we look forward to having you join us again right here. Next week, same time. Good night, everybody. Have a lovely, lovely evening. The Grief Diaries radio show is brought to you by Alley Blue Media and Good Grief Worldwide, an official partner of National Grief Awareness Day, working to bring grief out of the darkness into the light. For more information about Grief Diaries or to listen to archived episodes, please visit www.griefdiaries.